it's Sunday, August 22. I'm continuing to reflect with you on the subject of friendship. Last week we began to think about friendship kind of as a horizontal relationship. We were thinking about the greatness of friendship, how it's such a gift, something that enriches our lives in many meaningful and good ways. And today, as the second and concluding message on friendship, we are going to think about it in terms of the more vertical component. So our friendship with Jesus Christ, the greatest of friends. We're going to reflect on the same passage of scripture recorded in John chapter 15, but I want you to just remember a couple of things that I mentioned last week. Primarily that friendship is something that is a shared life. There is something deep and profound about a relationship that we have, especially with close or best friends. There is you, there is a friend, and then there is this third thing, a shared life that the two of you have together. We're going to think about that this morning as that relates in an incredible way to the friendship that we have with Jesus, a shared life with him. So let's think about that in connection again with these words recorded in John chapter 15. Jesus says these words to us again today. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. I have called you friends. Just think for a moment about how incredible a statement that is. It's one thing when someone calls us his or her friend. We feel the warmth of that the joy of that. But think about Jesus, the Son of God, the Lord of glory, the King of the universe, saying to you, I have called you my friend. It's really astonishing when you think about it. I mentioned last week that friends love each other in spite of all their faults and shortcomings, in spite of all the ways that we disappoint each other, true friends still love and accept and forgive us. Love, as we read in that great chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, never fails. Now, this is ultimately true in the kind of friendship that we have with Jesus. There's an old saying that goes like this, a friend is someone who knows everything about you and still likes you. Well, ultimately, that's true of the kind of love that Jesus has for us. He knows everything about us, all of our doubts, all of our fears, all of our sins, and yet he still chooses us. He still calls us his friend. Remember how when Jesus spoke these words in John 15, he was speaking to disciples whom he knew would soon desert him. When he needed friends the most, they weren't there for him. These are the last hours of Jesus' life here on earth. And he's there in the company of his disciples, his friends, and he knows very well, in fact, as he predicted, that they would soon desert him. They would abandon him. And yet, in spite of that, he speaks these incredible words of love to them. You are my friends. It's a sobering picture of the failure of human friendships. The way we sometimes treat our friends, the way we ultimately treat our truest and greatest friend, Jesus, disappointing him, failing him, in ways that are beyond our capacity to fully understand. And yet, he comes to us with these incredible words, I have called you friends. I have chosen you. 
It says something incredible about the way Jesus sees people. When you read the gospel accounts of his public ministry, it's incredible to see how he saw people and how people saw him, how they felt that when they were in the company of Jesus, they were accepted and loved. And that this is even true of the most uh, hardened sinner, the most rebellious person, the, the person who felt the least welcome and included in any other human context, felt warmed and loved by the friendship of Jesus Christ. One writer describes the way Jesus saw people these, in these words. Jesus had an uncanny ability to look past the obvious flaws in people's lives. He could envision what they would become if the power of God were in, unleashed in their lives. He somehow saw the godly worshiper clothed as a worn, wearied prostitute. He saw the faithful disciple hiding inside a cowardly fisherman named Simon. He saw the hidden philanthropist in the life of a crooked tax collector named Zacchaeus. He saw the risk taker in a Jewish ruler named Nicodemus. What a fantastic gift Jesus had for seeing what no one else could see. It's exactly the way he continues to see you and me and all people still today. I've been reading quite a bit about friendship over the last few weeks, and I have come across a number of definitions of friendship. There are so many different ways that you can understand and define the nature of friendship. Here's what I think is the best definition of friendship. What is a friend, if not someone who does not judge me, who does not abandon me when he or she discovers my weaknesses? my limitations, my wounds and shortcomings, everything that is broken within me. A friend is someone who sees my true beauty and potential and who wants it to be developed in me. A friend is happy to be with me. It's exactly what Jesus has in mind when he talks about how he wants his friends to bear fruit, to flourish, to experience a kind of life that can never be found except in a relationship with him. Jesus has come to give us the best life, and that's really his life that he shares with us in this third thing, this intimate and profound gift of friendship. When he talks about fruit in this chapter, and he uses that image quite a lot in John 15, he's using it as a, as a public or visible description of what is really an internal reality. When you see fruit growing on a tree, you know that that tree is healthy. And that's exactly the image Jesus has when he talks about being the true vine and every disciple, every friend is like a branch grafted into that vine. And so the fruit that's produced is really not our fruit. It's not because of all of our work and creative ingenuity or perseverance. No, it's the life of Christ, the life of friendship that he shares with us that creates this public display of his life in the world. It's what makes being friends with Jesus so great. Sometimes we think about being a Christian as if it's primarily about obeying, about duty, about obligation. There are all these things we need to do. And this is important. I mean, Jesus in these words does speak about commanding his disciples. And the only way we can remain his friends is if we do what he commands, primarily living a life of love. So there is a sense of duty about being a Christian. But when you think about your horizontal friendships, you know that you don't choose friends because of duty or obligation. You don't do things simply because you have to in their life. You do it because you want to, because you love them. Friends are always laying down their lives for each other in so many ways. That simply means we put their needs and priorities above our own. We submit to them. That's the nature of friendship. And this is why Jesus is our greatest friend. He laid down his life in the most profound example of that in human history, sacrificing himself for us and for the life of the world. And that's why the life that we have with Jesus is primarily a gift created for us. You know, there's a verse later in John's Gospel, in John chapter 17, that entire chapter is a beautiful prayer that Jesus prays shortly before 
He is tried, arrested, beaten, crucified, and he has this incredible saying in that prayer, this statement that again accentuates the gift and power of friendship. He's praying to the Father for his disciples, and in verse 6 of John 17, Jesus says this, I have revealed you to those you gave me. They were yours. You gave them to me. Now, that's an incredible statement when you think about it. So often we think about Jesus being God's gift given to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And that's certainly true. But have you ever thought about it in the opposite way? Where Jesus is not so much one given to us, but we are the ones given to him. It accentuates again how friendship is something God creates. Recall what I said last week about how friendships are not things we make. It's not because of our discrimination and our careful choosing. No, as C.S. Lewis comments, there's this master of ceremonies, the Lord Jesus, who creates friendships for us. He chooses us for each other. And this is exactly how a friendship with Jesus is also created. It's a gift God gives us to him. And this means that we can trust this friendship in spite of our doubts, our fears, our anxieties, our sins. It's something created for us. We don't need to create it. It's sustained by the power and grace of God. It makes me think of the well-known hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. One of the most famous hymns ever written. The words were originally a poem written by a man named Joseph Scriven. He was born in Ireland, but moved to Canada in 1845. He was a school teacher who lived in various places in Ontario, Clinton, Woodstock, Brantford, but he eventually settled in Eastern Ontario in and around Port Hope and along the shores of Rice Lake. Some came, believe that he came to Ontario to begin a new life. Back in Ireland, he was engaged to be married, but his bride-to-be drowned the night before their wedding day. Scriven was traumatized by that, understandably. He was also a deeply religious man. He belonged to the Plymouth Brethren Church, and in various places around Ontario, he preached. He led many people to the Lord. One of the people he witnessed to was a young woman named Catherine, in fact, they too were engaged to be married. She wasn't in great health. And when Scriven baptized Catherine in the icy waters of Rice Lake in April 1860, her health deteriorated even more. She contracted pneumonia as a result of her experience in the icy waters of Rice Lake that April morning. And she died later that summer. Two engagements, both ended by tragedy. Painful experiences that left Joseph Scriven not only discouraged, but these were experiences that plummeted him into bouts of serious depression. And yet, in the context of all that darkness and under the heaviness of that incredible sorrow, these words came to be written. What a friend we have in Jesus. When one of Scriven's friends found these words written on a piece of paper when he was visiting Joseph, he asked him if he wrote them. Yes, he said, the Lord and I did it between us. What a good thing to say about all of the things we do. The Lord and I did it together. It's a simple but really great description of the friendship that we have with Jesus. We do things together. The circumstances surrounding Joseph Scriven's death are uncertain. He also drowned in the cool waters of Rice Lake. In the very waters where he and Catherine stood some years before as he baptized her, plunging her in the chill of those waters and raising her up again, a graphic portrayal of dying and rising, the coldness of the grave, and being lifted out of that to receive the warmth of a, a new day, of the sun? Was it an accidental drowning that claimed Joseph's life or perhaps something different given his depressed state? No one knows. All that matters 
are the words that Joseph left for us to sing and to love. Jesus knows our every weakness. Who can find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? In his arms, he'll take and shield us. We will find a solace there, there in a friendship with Jesus. I hope you know that friendship. I hope you know that incredible gift that life created for you so that you can experience the joy of Jesus, the abundance of life, the fruit of life lived as God intends it to be lived. A life that is, of course, never one where there is no trouble or sorrow or fear or death but a life where there is this deep abiding friendship with Jesus, the greatest of friends. What a friend we have in Jesus. I hope this reflection and last week's as well has enabled you to have a renewed sense of how great it is to have friends, to be a friend, to receive the gift of friends, and to receive the greatest gift of friendship with Jesus Christ. I hope that this message encourages you and perhaps it may be something that you share with others to encourage them. We are all in different stages of, of our lives and perhaps, perhaps experiencing heavy burdens at this time, but what a friend we have in Jesus. He has called you friend. He sees in you something beautiful and he wants you to live a life of joy, a life that only anticipates the great life that will never live, end when we live with him in the beauty and peace and the brightness of his kingdom. Thanks so much for watching. I look forward to sharing more messages with you in the future. Be well.